Well, good morning, church. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Ben, for leading us in worship so far. Let's, uh, let's continue to worship the Lord through the study of his word. If you, uh, if you would, go ahead and open to that passage, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and we'll look at the first, uh, the first 22 verses of this, uh, of this chapter. While you're turning there, uh, just to catch you up a little bit, we are, we're talking about this man named John, um, often referred to as John the Baptist, and John is not new to us. Uh, when in the study of Luke, uh, the book of Luke really opens up with the prediction of John's kind of miraculous uh, conception and birth, uh, just an amazing thing that the Lord did for John's parents, and the Lord kind of reached into their lives and said, you're going to have a son, even though they were not expecting to, and, uh, and, and this son is going to do great things. He's got a special place in God's uh, plan, and so uh, as we anticipate uh, what this, this man, John, is going to do, uh, you might be forgiven for being a little surprised that this man grew up to live in the wilderness and eat grasshoppers and wear funny clothes and say weird things. John, John was a strange guy. He, he was a little bit of an outcast. He ate, he ate strange food. He wore strange clothes. He, he said the same strange things, being a strange man. And I think we would rightly uh, be uh, led to ask the question, uh, what's the big deal with this guy? Uh, But Luke spends a lot of time talking about John the Baptist, as do the other gospel writers. This guy is is kind of a big deal. And even though they spend so much time, I I think we could could kind of ask the question, you know, why should we care about this man? Um, Why why is it that we should pay attention to him? Uh, But I think it would be a mistake uh, to just jump over this section of Luke's gospel or to just kind of say, yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, He he was funny and he he did funny things and he baptized some people. Uh, Because Luke is putting putting, uh, the story and the, the, the telling of John's ministry here to teach us something, to help us understand something, ultimately not about John, but about the one John points to. See, John is uh, a character that we could really easily make a mistake uh, uh, in, in dealing with him, similar to the one that some of the people make later on in this passage, and that is to focus so much on John that we miss what John is pointing to. We've, we, this happens kind of all the time in life, right? Uh, especially with, uh, with little kids or whatnot. We just had Christmas time. How many of you were around a little kid that got a gift? They un, they un, you know, they wrapped, unwrapped the, the, or they tore up the wrapping paper. I know how to speak. Uh, they tore up the wrapping paper, uh, and and there is a box. And out of just sheer excitement about the unwrapping event, they're like, yes. And you're like, no, 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 you've got you to go into the box, right? Like the box is not the point, it's what's inside the box that's the point. Uh, you might also run into this situation if you ever get like a new puppy or something like that. And you want to try to teach the puppy how to like chase after something. And so you see like a squirrel and you point to the squirrel, what does the puppy look at? It looks at your finger right? He doesn't look at the squirrel, he looks at the the pointing that's going on. And I think we could make a similar mistake with John, couldn't we? Where he is is on the scene for a very particular purpose, and that is to be kind of a pointer. He's redirecting our gaze and our attention, not at himself, but at something else. And what he's pointing us to is the the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He's trying to herald to everyone who will listen, God is about to do something that is kind of the culmination, the, the fulfillment, the apex of what God has been doing throughout human history Please don't miss it. He, he is begging people not to miss that, an understanding of that something big is about to come on the stage. His whole life, his whole existence is about pointing to something else. And so we would be uh, wise, I think, to listen to John and to heed his, his pointing because what he does is he shows us that the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, The coming of the promised one, the coming of the Savior, demands something of us. As Jesus comes onto the scene, John wants us to understand that you need to get ready for his coming on the scene. 
And what it demands is genuine repentance for everyone who will receive his salvation. He's pointing us to the coming of the Messiah and he's saying, if you want in on this, you need to get yourself ready. And so we would be wise, I think, to heed John's pointing, even though we are kind of on the other side of the life and the ministry and the the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. He's kind of showing us, here's what it looks like to get in, to, to prepare for an encounter with Christ. Here's what it looks like to have your heart postured in such a way that you are ready to meet Jesus. And so as we launch into this text, let me just ask you to have this on your mind. What is the posture of your heart towards the Lord Jesus? What is your heart's posture? Because John is going to try to help you get it ready. He's going to help you orient your heart in a particular way in preparation to encounter the one he's pointing to. He's saying, he's coming, are you ready? And I would just ask all of us, are we we ready? Are we prepared to meet the Lord Jesus? Some of our hearts might just be cold towards Christ. Christ. We just really don't care that much about him. Some of us uh, might like the idea of Jesus, but not much of our lives is really built around or affected by who he is. Some of us might feel hurt or scared or, or, or somehow cast aside uh, by Jesus. Some of us might have actual kind of animosity and anger and hatred towards Jesus. John is going to help us prepare our hearts for the coming of the Lord Jesus. So let me uh, walk us through this, sec- uh, th- this passage in three sections and see how Luke tells us about John, not to make a big deal of John so much, but ultimately to make a big deal of the one John points to. Okay, so let's look at it in three sections. The first section I want you to see is John's ministry itself. What is John's ministry? You see it really kind of develop some in verses one through six. These verses tell us that John's ministry is first and foremost a ministry of preparation. As I've mentioned, he is not just, he's not pointing at himself, he's pointing at someone else, and that someone else has not yet come when he's teaching and preaching. When he is out in the wilderness proclaiming and preaching and baptizing, he is pointing to something that has yet to enter the stage of these people's awareness, their minds. They're not yet aware of the what is actually coming in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he is trying to get them ready. That is really what his ministry is about, is to get people ready. They know, or he knows something big is happening, and he knows the people around him are not ready to handle it. Okay, it, it, it makes me think of, uh, we just passed Christmas time, right? It makes me think of Home Alone, right? Where little Kevin McAllister, he's, first of all, left alone, tragedy, uh, but he's alone during Christmas, and then he happens to find out that there are these two robbers who are going to come and, and steal everything in his house. And so what does he do? There's this whole montage in the, the original Home Alone where he has to get prepared, and he sets all the little traps and everything like that, and this little kid is going to take on, you know, uh, Marv and Harry, I think. Is that what it is? Uh, these two guys, thank you. Yeah, uh, Marv and Harry. Okay, you guys know them. Uh, and, and so they're, they're, they're coming, and he has, to, he has to get ready because the house is not really set up to defend against Robert. Well, I don't think we should necessarily think about Jesus as like Marv from Home Alone. I think that might mess up with your mental conception of the Lord uh, a little bit. But the idea of Kevin having to get ready is appropriate, right? He was not in a position to handle this, and he has to get ready. And John is entering the stage and saying, you guys are not ready. You're you're not yet prepared for what is coming. John knew he was not the point. Someone else was the point. Someone else was really the fulfillment, the apex, the climax of what God is doing, and the people were not ready for the main event. And so that's what he's doing here, is he's pointing people to the coming of Christ, and he's saying, you've got to get prepared. You've got to get prepared. Well, he does this first. uh, uh, Luke is showing us the ministry of of John as a historical reality, which really sets this whole plan of redemptive history. What God is doing to save sinners like you and me is not some fairy tale, and it's not just some set of truth claim or some some kind of philosophical uh, musings. What it is, it is it is a historical reality. John 
prophesied in history and Jesus stepped into history to do the work of redemption for people who live in history like you and me. This is one of the beautiful things about the message of Christianity. So, so uh, Luke is trying to show the historicity, the reality, the truthfulness. All of these things are not just fairy tales. They're real kind of gritty history. That's why he's writing this whole book is to remind this man, Theophilus, that he can have confidence that the, the spiritual claim, his claims he's been exposed to are actually true. Like these things that we've been told about this man, John, and this man, Jesus, they're actually true. And so Luke goes on and he investigates and he kind of wants to situate us here. There's this man, John, during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the 15th year of his reign, And we can go back and we know that Tiberius started reigning around A.D. 14, which means we're somewhere around A.D. 29 or 30 when John enters the scene and he's pointing to something that is coming. He also orients us to some local rulers that we could go up and we can can study about and we can read about. Herod, Philip, Licinius, and Pilate. These are people that actually lived. And he said, during that time and the time of Annas and Caiaphas as the high priest, there was this man And the word in verse two, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Luke is presenting John as somewhere in the line of the Old Testament prophets for whom the word of God would come to him. He would receive the word and then have to turn around and proclaim it. John himself, though he was not the point, was a a feature and a, a part of God's redemptive plan to prepare his people for the coming of his Messiah. So what was his message? Well, you see it there in verse three. It was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We're gonna look at this message in more detail in the next section, but he summarizes it here for us, that he is proclaiming a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was synonymous with baptism, like it's in his name, John the Baptist. It's mentioned seven times, baptism is mentioned seven times in this passage. You can see it in verse three, verse seven, verse 12, verse 15, 16, and then twice in verse 21. It is a a real feature of this text, but it's also worth noting that in Luke's gospel, in this text, perhaps more than any of the other gospels, baptism is not really the focus. And John, the baptizer, is not really the focus. Even of John's ministry, it's not so much the baptisms that the, that's the focus, but the proclamation that's the focus. It's not John the baptizer that we're having to encounter here, although he does baptize. It's the message of John that we have to reckon with. He has to, he's proclaiming a, a message of baptism, sorry, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In verse seven, we'll even see that people are coming to be baptized. If you wanna jump down there real quick in verse seven, he says, uh, he said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, okay? There's no like fancy Greek you have to do there. He actually calls them a brood of vipers. These are people, so get this, these are people who come to John the Baptist to be baptized, what do you think your response would be? He's like, you're in the right place. I'm your guy. But that's not what he does. Because the point is not so much the baptism. These people were missing the message that the baptism kind of represented. They were taking John's baptism, but they were leaving the message that John proclaimed by the side, and he says, you're not really ready for this. Baptism in this passage really kind of functions as a kind of representation of John's larger message, namely that the people of God must repent because the Messiah is coming. If you didn't want that last part, well, don't worry about John's baptism. If you don't want to recognize that there is someone else coming who's got a greater work to do, who's more significance than John, then you don't really, you're not really gonna benefit from, from receiving John's baptism. Their lives and their hearts needed to be changed. The people that were coming to John for baptism, he knew that their lives and their hearts were completely out of sync with the Lord. And yet the Lord is coming. And he's saying, you don't just take the baptism. You've, you've got you've to take this message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he tells us. The forgiveness of sins. 
based on even this text, but the broader testimony of scripture, I think we can rightly conclude that what, jo- what John is not saying uh, and what Luke is not saying here is that the, the mere act of baptizing was something that could absolve them of their sins, that could lead to the forgiveness of their sins. You know, you, 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 images come to mind of John just kind of, you know, uh, tricking people down into the water and then just real quickly dunking in them, be like, boom, okay, forgiven, uh, next up. And, and just kind of running people through to kind of get the numbers up, to get people forgiven of their sins as though the washing of water is what could actually remove the sins of people. And that is not what Luke is saying and that's not what John is saying. The, the, the baptism and the repentance was away from something, but it was also to some, towards something, and namely towards someone. The repentance was to the Lord, and it was to receive the forgiveness that he is the, brings. The repentance that he calls for prepares us for Jesus, and Jesus is the one who brings about the forgiveness. That really becomes clear when you look at the quotation in verses four through six. If you look at verses four through six, your Bible probably has it offset a little bit. This is a quotation from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And this quotation is pulled from a very strategic point in the book of Isaiah. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah, for the most part, are, uh, are uh, wrapped up in the, or kind of composed of a primary message of the judgment of God against Israel for Israel's rebellion and against the nations for the nation's rebellion against God. Uh, it, is, it is at times a fairly, kind of, it's kind of a downer of a book uh, for the first 39 chapters. It's just kind of, it's heavy talking about the Lord's wrath and his judgment on like all people. Sometimes he's like, let's go to Israel, let's go to Egypt, let's go to you know, the next town, or let's go to Babylon, all that kind of stuff. Let's just, the whole earth, the judgment. I mean, just, just all of it and you just, whew, it's heavy. And then you get to verse, to chapter 40. And at chapter 40, something changes. The book of Isaiah at chapter 40 pivots from primarily a message of condemnation and judgment to a message of hope and salvation and redemption. And right there, at that pivot point, at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 40, there's this man crying out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Luke is trying to show us that John the Baptist is this man. He is at this pivot point. He is at this point where what the world deserves is judgment and condemnation. And yet the work that the Lord has begun to go about is one of redemption and forgiveness and salvation These verses are really just like John himself, not about the voice of one crying in the wilderness. They also are about the one the voice points to. The image here is the Lord who is entering into, or a king really, who is entering into a territory that he's, he's conquered or is part of his right and just rule where the king is coming in. And so you can just imagine if, if anybody comes, if you're like us at the Shaddix household, uh, if anybody's coming over, we try to straighten up a little bit, right? Um, maybe if uh, uh, somebody who you really respect is coming over, you try to straighten up a little bit more, Right? If, I don't know, uh, the governor was coming over, you'd probably Lysol something or something like that, you know? (laughs) And what I don't want you to do is to draw any conclusions. If you have been to my house and it's not been cluttered, I don't really mean that to reflect how much I respect you, but you get the idea, right? Is is there's a preparation that happens that somewhat reflects the the, the dignity and the honor of the one who is coming. And and in this image, the idea is that king is entering into his territory, and so go out into the streets, clear out the the rocks, go dust everything, make sure that you don't, don't have trash on the side of the road, all that kind of stuff. The king is coming, and we need to get ready for him. That's the image that that, uh, Isaiah is trying to bring to mind, and that's the image that Luke is throwing us back to, except notice what the territory is in Isaiah chapter 40. What is it that we have to do to prepare for this king? He doesn't say, go pick up trash off the side of the road. He doesn't say, make sure there's no rock so he doesn't, you know, hurts his toe or something like that. He says, valleys need to be brought up. 
Mountains need to be brought low. The suggestion here is that this king's territory is all creation. It's the earth himself that the king is now entering into. And the the voice of the one crying into the wilderness is saying, God himself is now entering into his territory. He is is coming into his people. And we need to make sure that the, the way is paved for him. But in order to do that, it's not just kind of clean up a little bit. It's mountains have to be brought low and valleys have to be raised up. There's a, a massive amount of, of, of turning over that has to happen. Why? Because the king of all the earth is coming. The king of all things is entering into his territory, and John is looking at the people around him and saying, you are not ready. You are not ready. When this king comes, he brings something with him. He doesn't just bring judgment like Isaiah had been talking about and as we'll talk about in just a second, but verse six tells us that when this king enters into his territory, what is it that will be put on display? When the king of all things, the God of the universe, enters into his territory, what is it that they will be led to see in that time? It's not judgment primarily, it's salvation and all the earth is going to see it. There's this picture of the fact that when, when the king enters in, when the Messiah that is promised actually steps onto stage, the thing that's going to be put on display is the rescue and the redemption and the salvation and the forgiveness of sins that God's people have been longing for. That is what John is pointing to. He is the voice of the one crying, crying in the wilderness, but he is pointing to the Lord Jesus who is coming, and he's saying, you guys need to get ready. You need to get ready. The Lord is coming. The king is coming. He's entering his territory. Are you ready? And so I would just encourage you, friend, brother, sister, member of this church, are you ready? He's trying to help us get our hearts in a posture of readiness to to encounter the Lord Jesus. And I would just ask, are you ready to meet him? That's John's ministry. Let's look at John's message in verses 7 through 14. In John's message, you can really boil it down to one word, repent. Repent. The word repentance only really appears twice in these verses, in in verse 3 and then again in verse 8. But the idea of repentance is everywhere. If you're not familiar with the Bible or the language that's used here, repentance sounds, sounds fancy, but it really just means kind of a change of mind that actually leads to a change of a way of living. It's a change of mind and heart. It's a reorienting towards something uh, uh, that, that changes our whole being. It suggests a change of direction where I, I am going in this direction, but the repentance requires me to stop, pivot, and go a different direction. I've been wearing this set of clothes. I need to take this set of clothes off and then put on a new set of clothes. What he's inviting people to is to totally reorient their lives away from the things they have been following after and instead to chase after the one who is coming, to prepare themselves for the one who is coming. So he calls them to repent. And this repentance, like I I mentioned, is not just kind of a, a... Uh, okay, I repent, you know, Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy out into the wind. uh, uh, That's not how this works. Uh, If you don't know the office, that's fine. You get the idea. You don't just declare bankruptcy, Uh, okay? You you have to, there's more that goes along with repentance than just, I repent. Um, But instead, there's a a life that flows from that. You can see that in a couple places in this this passage. In verse 8, He very explicitly tells the crowds to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And then in verse 9, he presents this image of trees that either do bear fruit or don't bear fruit, where the ones who do bear fruit are are, uh, good trees and are worth keeping. The ones who don't bear fruit are are kind of, I don't want to say fake trees, I guess they're real trees, but they're worthless and they deserve to be cut down and destroyed The idea of repentance is not just changing your mind about something. It is reorienting your mind and your heart away from, and in these people's circumstance, and in our circumstances, our situation, we're reorienting ourselves away from sin and rebellion against God and even self, and instead we're turning to the Lord, and it's a call to reorient ourselves around the coming Messiah. 
You see what John is doing here? He's just saying, he's coming. You're off kind of doing your own little thing. And to really be prepared for his coming, you need to turn and you need to reorient yourselves entirely around who he is and what he is doing. And so he calls them to repent, but not just to, not just to claim repentance, but to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I love that phrase, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I am, I'm hard pressed to think of a better kind of summary of the Christian life, the ongoing Christian life, then bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It is an invitation to even though, even you, those of you who are in Christ, even those you, who, of you who are Christians who, who really believe in Jesus, it's not just a thing that you, you've declared back there or claimed back there or anything like that, but now it is a whole way of life and it is a continuing in that way of life that results in the bearing fruit that is consistent with our repentance. And so Christian in the room, I would just uh, ask you this morning, is your life marked by bearing fruit that is in keeping with the repentance that you have professed? Is your life, is your kind of faith in the Lord Jesus, is that not just something that happened back then, but is something that you are continuing on because your life is bearing fruit of a, of a total orientation around his coming? That's the invitation of John for us this morning. His message is repent. I wanna walk through the kind of the the two sections, two paragraphs uh, of this section, verses seven through nine and then verses 10 through 14. And I wanna ask two questions about this message of repentance. First of all, why repent? And then secondly, how? The simple answer to why is because judgment is coming. Not only is salvation coming, he's emphasized that with the coming of the Lord, all the nations, the whole world is gonna see his salvation put on display. But when it comes to the need for repentance in their lives, this reorientation, it's because they, he sees, John sees in their lives and we can see in our own lives that our tendency is to to be oriented around almost anything other than the Lord Jesus. Is that right? You don't have to look very far, right? We can see out in the world that, that this world is, is broken. Something's off. Something is distorted, right? You just, I mean, it could be illness. It can be wars. It can be infighting. It can be mistrust of fa- within family. It can be all kinds of things. It could be deception between people, relational fracture. We can look out in the world and we could say, man, something, something is off out there, right? But the reality, if we're honest, is we don't have to look out there. We can look in our own hearts, and we can see and feel and sense and know something is, something is off here, isn't it? I am off. I am broken. And the reality is that a holy God is completely righteous in judging rebellious, sinful people like you and me. The need for repentance is urgent because judgment is coming. It's coming. In verse 7, you get a group of people who come to Jesus and it seems like they're aware. They have an awareness that wrath is coming. They're, 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 they're Israelites. They're aware of the, the, the kind of the message of the Old Testament, uh, which the prophets can really be summed up in this word, repent. Uh, uh, and and they're, they're aware of the need to, to repent But in verse seven, we get the hint that their repentance is kind of surface level, isn't it? He said to the crowds, therefore, who came, sorry, who came out to him to be baptized, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? These were crowds who were interested in escaping wrath. They knew that it was coming and they wanted to escape it. The problem is, is that they weren't serious about the one who could deliver them from it. They were just using John and using Jesus so that they can escape wrath. But John, interestingly, interestingly, he does not say there's no wrath. He does not correct them. He just says you're wanting, you're chasing after the wrong thing. You're not sincere about this. He acknowledges the danger of judgment, that the holy judgment of God is real and you should be concerned about it. You just aren't sincere in your repentance. And then again, when you jump down to verse nine, you see this image of God actually executing judgment on those who do not truly repent. John's message is an urgent call to repent, to turn. Why? Because judgment is real 
friends. Like the holiness of God against sin is real and it is serious and it is unrelenting. He hates sin. He despises it. His, his holiness in re, kind of reaction or interaction with sin, it, it manifests in wrath and judgment and he is perfectly right to do that. That puts you and that puts me in a really bad spot. The call to repent is urgent for us because judgment is coming. And in this text, we get a warning that being aware of the judgment is not enough. You've got to run to the right place for safety. You see that there are two places in this text that the people are inclined to run to and say, well, if judgment is coming, maybe this will help me out. You see first the religious ritual. They knew that judgment was coming. They were coming to John for what? For baptism. And he says, no, you don't want the message. You don't want the king. You don't want the Messiah. You just want the rescue from the wrath. Friends, religious ritual, going through the rite of baptism will save none of us. And we can add to that going to church, going to small group, paying your tithe, reading your Bible, praying enough, whatever that looks like. None of those religious rituals will be able to rescue you. Now, I'm in favor of all of those things in the same way that John's in favor of baptism, but we have to understand them. They cannot rescue you. It is no safe harbor from the wrath and the judgment of God. Religious rituals like baptism will not save you. Neither will kind of privileged family relationships. You see in verse eight, he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. These were Jews who were coming to him and they were claiming, why do we need to repent Why do we need this? We are the people of God. We're a part of the family of God. Surely this is not for us. And John anticipates the objection. He jumps out ahead of it and he says, your family lineage is not going to do anything for you to rescue you from the wrath of God. The judgment of the just and holy God will not be appeased because you have the right last name. And kids, let me just talk to you guys for a second. Many of you are are right now currently being raised in faithful Christian homes and you should be incredibly thankful to God for the gift of of being raised by, by godly parents who teach you the Bible, who teach you the gospel. What a gift it is to have parents who want to teach you about the Lord Jesus. But kids, make no mistake, your family cannot and will not save you from your sins. Because you have good, loving parents. They cannot. They would if they could. They can't. They cannot save you. The people of Israel here were tempted to think, but we're in the lineage of David, or sorry, of, of Abraham. Abraham received the promise. This is God's special people. That's who I belong to. And, and you, know what, you know what John tells them? It's about as useful no, he doesn't say it like that. He says, um, here's, here's, how, here's how much God is impressed with your lineage. He would rather make out of rocks someone to praise his name than to ascribe to your family your salvation. God does not need your family. He does not need your last name. He does not me- need my last name. He can bring about people who praise his name from rocks in the ground. You are interchangeable with rocks. John says, do not run to your family relationships. Do not run to your heredity. Do not run to your background. None of those things can rescue you. Why? Well, the whole time he's pointing to the Messiah to come. He's the one who rescues you. He's the one who can save you. He's the one who has actually come to bring about your salvation. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in your family. Don't trust in your religious rituals. Instead, trust in the one who is coming into his kingdom and he brings salvation. This is what Christ is doing. Okay, we gotta keep moving. The how of, uh, of repentance. He has three conversations 
about how repentance plays out. He's got a conversation in verses 10 and 11 with the crowds, with tax collectors in verses 12 and 13, and then again with soldiers in 14. Okay, and I want you to notice a few things. First, that each of these, each of these uh, uh, kind of instructions for what it looks like to live in repentance is uh, uh, marked by a concern for the good of others and primarily and especially for the poor and the vulnerable. Right? To, the, to the crowds, he tells them, if you've got an extra tunic, give it to somebody who's in need. If you've got some extra food, give it to somebody who's in need. Okay? Look around for the needs around you and meet those needs. That's what it looks like to walk in repentance, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. When he gets to the tax collector, he basically says, don't cheat people. Only charge what you're supposed to. When he gets to the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the officers in the army, to the to the soldiers, he basically tells them, don't abuse the, the, the role that you've got to oppress people, but instead, just be content with your wages. Don't, don't use your position to gain, but instead, trust the Lord. Do not, do not take advantage of the poor and the vulnerable among you. So connected with this is a, a warning not to abuse power. Not to take advantage of opportunities so that you can, you can Im- improve yourself or pursue your selfish gains. The last thing I want you to note, though, about all of these instructions is that they are not particularly radical, are they? They're not especially profound. I mean, think about the, the tax collectors and the soldiers. These are people who are cooperating with the Roman Empire who is effectively kind of oppressing the people of God in Israel. They are cooperating with the oppressive Roman Empire. You would think that what John tells the tax collector who comes to him and says, what what does this look like? What does repentance look like for me? He says, get out of Dodge. You gotta quit your job. But that's not what he said, is it? He just says, do it faithfully. Do it honorably. Do it respectfully. Same thing with the soldier. He doesn't tell him he needs to quit. Notice he doesn't tell any of these people they need to sell everything they have and move to a faraway country to tell people about Jesus. I do think the Lord calls people to that. I just want to make sure that we understand that baseline repentance does not lead to the have to have this kind of stick. In the, if you're like me and you're like, man, I, I noticed this area of sin, what I want to do is I want to do some big kind of like uh, New Year's rev- resolution style pivot, right? Where it's like, from now on, for the rest of my life, I am never going to. That's not really the claims that he's asking them to make, is it? He says, these, these acts of sin and rebellion that you're committing, stop. Love the people around you. Care for the needy among you. Repentance doesn't necessarily take the form of this big dramatic action. Instead, what it takes the form of is reorient our, or reorienting our lives around the God who saves us and then living in accordance with his will and his ways. It's to live in a way that pleases him. We do not have to impress him. We are called to please him. So that's John's message. It's one of repentance. Lastly, I want us to look at the one John has been pointing to the whole time. John's Messiah. Last few verses of this section invite us to consider Jesus, to consider the Messiah to whom John was pointing. And I want you to see three things about John's Messiah in this this passage. In verses 15 through 18, I want you to see that John's Messiah was greater than him. His Messiah was greater than him. The people in verse 15 are, are beginning to wonder. We, we knew somebody was coming. We knew God was doing something amazing. Could it be that John is the man that God has sent? He is, is he the Christ? And John jumps in at that point real quick and just says, time out, time out. We're not gonna play games with this. I am not him. I, he really wants them to understand that the one who is coming after him is greater than he is. He is not the Christ. Instead, he wants to point people to the Christ. And so he points out three areas, at least three areas, in which Jesus is greater than he is. Jesus has a greater power. He says in verse 16 that the one who is coming is mightier than I. He's stronger, he's bigger, he's more more profound, he's more powerful, he has more might and authority. He also wants them to see that Jesus has a greater honor. He sees himself next to the one who is coming, the Messiah that is coming, great as John is. And Jesus would later say, there has never been anybody born of woman who is greater than John. 
That's what Jesus would say about John and John's understanding of his role in relation to the Messiah that was coming is I am not even worthy to tie or untie his sandals. He saw Jesus as so much greater in his honor and his worth and he saw the Messiah as so much greater in his ministry, the ministry that he does. In verse 16, John says that his water was of baptism. We've already talked about the fact that the ritual of baptism does not have any kind of magical powers. John was aware of that. He's not naive. He knows that just dipping somebody under the water doesn't all of a sudden, you know, make them holy or anything like that. He says, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming after me, he's got the real stuff. I'm pointing towards something. He's got the substance. I'm, I'm foreshadowing something. He's the real deal. He's the one who has come onto the scene. So I'm going to baptize you with, with water, but Jesus' baptism, baptism is going to be with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It is, it is a more substantive, more real, more lasting, more spiritual, more perfect baptism. Yes, he wants to baptize people, but he wants to baptize people so he can point them to the one who can actually do the work that they need to happen. The baptism by the Holy Spirit and fire is not meant to be seen as, as really two different baptisms, either like we all go through the Holy Spirit baptism and then the fire baptism, or you know, some people get the Holy Spirit and some people get the fire. I don't think that's what it's talking about either. I think what he's trying to show here is that, that this baptism is one that, that is a dividing baptism. Some are going to be baptized into a, 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 because of their faith in Christ. They're going to be baptized into the family of God and receive the Holy Spirit and be born again and walk with him. And then others are going to, because of the rebellion against Jesus, they are going to spend eternity experiencing the judgment that they deserve. There is a division that happens with Jesus' ministry. John's coming and proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Jesus comes to divide the world. He comes to divide the world with his baptism. Some will accept him. You get this, uh, this picture in the, the image that he gives where in verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the, his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the, uh, the barn. The winnowing fork is basically just a tool he's using to separate the good stuff from the bad stuff. And he's saying the good stuff is entering into his barn, his house, his family, his people. And the chaff is thrown into the fire and, and it's meant for burning. Jesus was greater than John. John doesn't want us focused on him. He wants to point us to the one who is greater. John's Messiah was greater than him. He also wants us to see that John's Messiah was was worthy. John's Messiah, we might say, is worth it. In verses 18 through 20, we get the story, kind of the, the conclusion of John's role in this whole narrative. Because of his commitment to prepare the way of the Lord, John would would experience suffering and eventually death. He was so committed to the obedience of the one who is coming that he was willing to go even to the ones who were in power. You know, the the proclamation of the one who is coming, the Messiah that is entering the stage, is that he is the king of all things. And so John, as part of his ministry to prepare the way of the Lord, has to go even to the kings and those who are in authority and declare, you are not outside of this king's rulership. You are not outside of this king's authority. But instead, even you. And so he calls out King Herod for his sin, and the consequences of that and his other exhortations towards obedience and repentance offend Herod and lead him to be put in jail. Why would John do that? It's because his Messiah was worth it. His Messiah was worth it. And I think even something like that ought to, ask us, ought to cause us to ask the question, what might this Messiah ask of you that would be too much? What would be too great an ask for you? Would it be to offend a family member, to lose a job? Would it be to have to reorient various areas of your life because they're caught up in sin? For John, he looked at the coming Messiah and he saw someone who is worth his total obedience even unto death. The last thing I want you to see in this passage is that John's Messiah was ready. He was ready. In verses 21 and 22, we get a very brief explanation of Jesus' own baptism. 
It says that when, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus gets baptized, presumably by John, according to other uh, of the gospel writers, but Luke doesn't even mention him. What we have here is this transitional moment where John is actually fading into the background. We don't even need him to point anymore because the Messiah himself is now on the stage, taking center stage. Jesus himself receives his baptism. And we might ask the question, why does he have to repent? Uh, why, you know, Jesus is, we even talked about last week, uh, how he has no sin in and of himself to repent of. Why, why is it that Jesus would receive John's baptism of repentance? And what we see in this text is God placing his stamp of approval, saying, this is the guy. My plan as it is unfolding is focused on this man right here. It's interesting that in the passage we looked at last week when Jesus entered the temple, he explained the reason he went back to the temple because he had to be in his father's house. It was a confession on the lips of the the young boy Jesus that God himself was his father. What we have in this passage is the reverse. We have God speaking down from heaven saying, this is my son. And we have it with the fullness of the divine presence. We have the voice of God the Father. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit manifested like a dove. And we have the sun and the water. And it's almost like the, God, uh, uh, the Godhead himself is, is coming down and saying, it's all, it's all culminating in this moment right here. The Messiah, the King, the one who is entering into the stage of world history to put on display salvation for all people, to call them to repentance, to call them to trust himself. Here is the man. We don't need you anymore, John. You can fade to black. Jesus is ready. And from this point on, the focus of Luke's gospel is going to be lasered, laser focused, lasered in on the man Jesus Christ, the Messiah, whose ministry was now prepared for him, and he gets to walk to accomplish God's redemptive purposes, to bring about salvation for you and for me, if we would repent of our sins and trust in him. That's the invitation for us this morning. It's to repent. It's to reorient our lives away from sin and selfishness and rebellion against God and instead to look at his divine plan and say, that's for me. No longer am I going to orient my, lives or my life around, around me and my stuff. It's gonna be oriented around the Messiah that has come. He is the one who brings salvation. He is the one who has done the work that I could not do and that you could not do. He lived a perfect life. He died a death for us, taking on our judgment. And he invites us to find our hope and our salvation in him. May that be true for all of us this morning. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for John. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for Luke and recording this text for us. God, I just pray for the people of IDC. I pray for myself. I pray for any visitors that are joining us this morning. God, that we would be marked by the kind of repentance John calls us to. God, that we would turn away from those things that are rebellious and sinful against you. Lord, and that we would see in your provision of the Messiah a perfect salvation, a perfect Savior. God, I pray if there's anybody here who does not know you, themselves are still in their rebellion. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they even today would turn away from self and turn to you. Trust in your gracious provision of a Savior. God, I pray for those of us who are believers, Lord, that you would give us a a, a joy in bearing fruit that keeps with uh, repentance, that reflects what you've done in our lives, Lord, and help us to walk in your ways in a way that pleases you, just as the Lord Jesus did. In his name we pray, amen.